uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's incidentally, we're going to be talking about healing and uh, the gift of healing. Who in here believes that God heals people? Say amen, raise your hand. Amen. Amen. He's a good God to us. He really is. He's a very, very good God. He's not... God, the, the concept that a lot of people have of God, he's up in heaven, mad at everybody all the time, disgusted with everybody, fixing to, fixing to throw it in all together. And that's really not the God of the Bible. And I believe in God's judgment. I absolutely believe in God's judgment. I believe in God's wrath. I see that all throughout the scriptures. But God loves those that don't love him. Okay? He loves it. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. That means wicked, hell-deserving, low-down sinners that don't want anything to do with God, God waters their crops for them. That's what he does, okay? He's a good God. God heals people, and uh, we see the, the ministry of Christ uh, as he, for three and a half years, as he, as he you know, traveled around. The Bible says he would, he would heal people. We have instances where lame people walked again. I mean, people that didn't have, any, didn't have anything, they walked again. There was a man whose, uh, whose right hand was withered, and we've seen people like that, maybe a brain injury or something like that. Anyway, their hands withered. It's atrophied to what happens to muscles. You don't use them muscles, and they just kind of lock up on you, and it just withers up, and he's walking around with this withered hand. Can't, can't do a whole lot of, of gardening and crop raising and things like that. Can't walk. Can't and, f and they couldn't get, in, couldn't get him into the crowd, and they opened the roof up, and they lowered him down right in front of a Jesus. And on the, uh, the unmitigated gall of Jesus to heal that man on the Sabbath day, how dare he do something like that on the Sabbath day? But he did. He healed him on the Sabbath day, and he said, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Well, the Pharisees, they all come in glued, and they thought, well, we got him now because he's told this man to break the Sabbath. God, in his law, never, never said that no man could pick up his bed. But the Jews had added all these little instructions on how to keep the law and how not to break it. And they said, if, if, you, if you do something like that, you're working. Well, that's not what God said. God had actually, he, when he talked about it in the fourth commandment, uh, he later on is talking about other Sabbath days, and he said, do no servile labor. That means don't go to work. That's what that means. But cows don't know when the Sabbath day is. Amen? You got to milk cows on the Sabbath day. You got to feed chickens on the Sabbath day and all that stuff. So anyway, but that's, that's what he was getting at. And Jesus went around healing people. In some cases, in some cases, there were devils attached with these people, and he cast out those devils. The Bible does not teach us that every, every malady of our flesh is because we've got a devil. And let me tell you something. According to this book right here, a born-again, Bible-believing, spirit-filled Christian cannot be possessed with a devil. You do not have... You, see, you got a throne in your heart. There's a king sitting on that throne. Who is that? Is that King Jesus? Okay? If you're born again, that's who that is. He's not powerless to stop the devil from coming and moving in. He's not powerless. There are not, you cannot be filled with a devil and possessed by a devil. You can be oppressed or depressed or whatever. You can be pressed down and burdened by spirits. I had that happen to me. I'm sure you have it happen to you. But they cannot take control of your body. Don't let anybody tell you that that is a, that's a lie. In fact, it's a set up doctrine because the only way then that you can have that taken out is to go to some guy and he is going to heal you and deliver you of your devils. And usually there's money exchanged. Watch out for that stuff. Amen. Watch out for that stuff, all right? But anyway, I believe in biblical healing. I believe that, um, I believe that God heals. I believe that, um, that I believe that we can pray and ask God to heal us of things. And if it is in God's will, he will heal you. If it is not in God's will, he will give you something better than healing. Okay? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of walk in that area a little bit this morning because there's so much misunderstood. There's people running around telling everybody that everybody should get healed of everything all the time. That is a lie. It's not true, and it's not biblical. Okay? Anybody, who, anybody here who has had something going on in their body and you ask God to heal you from it and he did not do it, raise your hand. Okay? Now... That Holy Ghost charismatic crowd, 
will lay a burden on you and tell you you're not spiritual enough. That's your problem right there. there there's something, that, and you've, you've heard them say that to you, and you're, you're nodding your head going, and you had a picture in your mind of who said it to you. They will tell you that you, it's your fault, you don't have enough faith, you didn't really believe, you didn't set free, you didn't release something out of you, and it's your fault that you, that you now here's the funny thing, stuff like that comes from Oral Roberts and Kenneth Hagin and all those guys. Does anybody know what happened to Oral Roberts? By the way, the last, about the last 10 years you saw him, he was wearing these big old thick glasses. You know why? Couldn't see, but he's wearing glasses. Do you might know what he died of? Cancer. The guy that went around pinning everybody else for not having enough faith to get healed died of cancer. And that's what happens. Kenneth Hagin, same thing. I don't know what he died of, but he died. Same thing. It's a setup. It's usually to pull money out of people's pockets or to inflict some sort of bondage on them by telling them they are not adequate enough or they do not uh, qualify under God's terms to be healed. That's a lie. It hurts people. It's a setup for people to fall away rather than draw closer to God. I've told this before, and I'm going to tell it again. I, I used to be friends with a guy. I haven't seen him in years. Or it's not like we had a falling out or anything like that. But his name was, well, he, had a, he had a ministry for children. He called Big Mike Ministries. Very talented, gifted children's minister. In fact, he was children's minister up at Life Christian Center up here on Highway 30 for years under uh, uh, Rick, something another, Perry or something like that. No, it's not Rick Perry. But anyway, huh? Rick Shelton. Okay, so you know Mike. You ever met Mike? Great guy. Great guy. I mean, he used to go around doing VBSs and stuff like that, and we kind of kind of struck it up, and we'd have lunch every now and then. And he told me, he said, Mike, he said, I'm thinking coming out of the charismatic movement. He was Joyce Meyer's radio talk guy. He did all the voiceovers for Joyce Meyer's ministries. And I looked at him, and he said, let me tell you a story. And he said, I knew a guy, and he said, uh, he was up there going to church with us. He said, did everything he was told to do. Paid, he had big business, paid large sums of money. Evangelists come in, he'd, he'd pay everything for them, put them up. I mean, just do everything in the world he was told to do. And he was successful. He had a big business. He had seemed like everything was going for him. He had a wife and children, nice house, and just doing everything in the church. Everything's going well. He got a sickness, got some kind of illness or a disease or something like that. And that afflicted his health so bad that he couldn't work. And pretty soon he lost his business. And when he lost his business, guess who left him? His wife left him. Took the house. So he lost his health, lost his house, lost his business, lost his income, lost his family. He's got nothing. He goes to Rick Shelton, and he says, Rick, wh what's wrong here? I, I don't understand. I've done everything. Rick said, obviously, there's something you're not doing right. Obviously, there's something that you're holding back on God, and, and that's, that's preventing God from, from working these miracles in your life. That man left. He said, I'll never be back. He said, I've done everything that I can do, and you're telling me that I didn't do enough? Let me take, I'll take a look up here. What is that? The cross. Do you know that Jesus took stripes on his back at the cross? The Bible says by his stripes we're healed. By, by whose, whose stripes? His. His work, his cross, the finished work is everything to the, to the sinner and to the Christian. It's everything. And they'll lay burdens on you and tell you you're not good enough, you didn't squeeze out enough faith, you didn't, sh you didn't shout the demons out loud enough, you didn't say the right words, you didn't have the, penal uh, the right positive mental attitude, you didn't have this or that or the other, you didn't have what it takes to get healed, you poor sap, you. That's what they tell you. That stuff makes me mad, makes me angry. Because I like for people to be set free instead of being put in bondage. And the idea, and it's, it is, I'm seeing it in a lot of places, the idea that you must perform, that you must do, that you must say all the right things and so on, is nothing more than a works-based religion, and it's not Bible Christianity. It has nothing to do with it. Now I'm going to show it to you.
Uh, hold your place there in 1 Corinthians 12 and turn to 2 Corinthians 12. If I've taught this once, I've taught it a dozen times, but it keeps coming back as being so relevant. The idea that, that um, you must, you ha you're, you've, something's wrong with you and it's all your fault and you have nobody to blame but yourself and on and on and on is the idea that God doesn't love you. God, God wants to perform something, but he can't because you're pushing him back with some, somehow, some way. Who in here thinks that they're bigger than God? You're not. God is the one who can hold the walls of the Red Sea so the Israelites can walk through. They didn't hold that open themselves. In fact, if you go look, go look at, at Exodus 14. Study the mentality of the Israelites when God opened up the Red Sea. You know what the Israelites were down there doing as God opened up the Red Sea? They were murmuring God against God. Why'd you bring us out here to die? Why are you trying to kill us? And God said, stand back. Does that sound like a positive mental confession to you that Israel was making to get the, to get the waterway opened up? They were down there, and I, I t can I be honest with you? I know what that's like to be sitting at the shore of the Red Sea murmuring against God. I've done it. You know what God did for me while I did that? Open the Red Sea. You know why? Why flowers when she was in a bad mood? Guess what you're going to do this week? <laughs> you buy your wife flowers when she's in a bad mood. Not because she deserves it. Not because she was sweet and nice to you. Okay, I'll buy you flowers. <laughs> You go out and do it while she ain't doing right. That's what you do. That's what God does with his people. Second Corinthians chapter 12, are you there? Say amen. amen. Verse 6, Paul said, For though, though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now if I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And I hope... One of my sincerest desires is for anybody either sitting in the pew or sitting on the other side of the camera is to not see me above what I really am. I don't want that. I don't want anything to do with it. And so he said in verse 7, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now who gave it to him? God gave him the thorn, uh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Let me ask you a question. These people that are going around telling everybody, if you have enough faith and God will heal you, what happens when it looks like they're healed? You know what they do? Boast. Boast. They boast against other people you didn't do it I did God is not going to let you get away with your arrogance he won't do it when you stand before the righteous and holy judge he's not going to pat you on the back and saying well, I'm glad you let me do stuff in your life God gave him the thorns. And then verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And I asked you a question a while ago. Who in here has ever asked God in sincerity to heal you of something? And he didn't do it. Why? Why didn't he do it? Well, he says it right here. Verse 9, He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in what? I don't know. Maybe God wanted you strong. Maybe he did. Maybe he wanted you strong. The Bible says we then that are strong ought to help the infirmities of who? The weak. So, yeah, maybe there are some people that can handle stuff pretty well and they seem to be got it all together. And may, maybe there are people like that. 
I'm not one of them. I've tried to be, but I failed at it. And so, if it, wouldn't, if it was not for God, if it was up to me and my ability to perform and my ability to do, then I would not be here today. No way, no how. I would not be here today. So, when, when I am weak, he is made strong. Most gladly, therefore, what Paul said, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, if you want to do something interesting, um, write, write this down, go home, study it, the word infirmity or infirmities. Um, get, get the software downloaded on your computer, whatever. Um, we have it freely available. It'll search out every word and phrase in the King James Bible. It'll search out every one of them. And look at the word infirmity, infirmities. It, the, according to the scripture, that word is not limited to the flu, cancer, backaches, or whatever. It encompasses the infirmity. Now, I want you to listen to this, and this is real good. It encompasses the infirmity of sin. Who's got one of those? That's an infirmity. We're sick with it. It's a disease like leprosy. Okay? And God, God will give you, he'll either, if you've got, if you got something wrong with you, something, something, something here, maybe, some people do, something here, God will either heal you or he'll give you something better than healing. My question is, why would you settle for something second best? Now, if God wants to heal you, he'll heal you. Um... As far as physical things, uh, the day that I was electrocuted, what didn't happen was it didn't put me into cardiac arrest. Um, it's debatable, but apparently it didn't fry my brain cells. And it didn't kill me. It came close. But God delivered me from that, and I asked him, I was ready to die, but I said, I don't want to leave my wife and kids yet. Boom, gone. It's over with. Now, I couldn't move for a week, but God kept me from that. He blessed me and gave me that, gave me life, okay? And that's fine. Um, but I've had, I've had injuries as a result of it. I had to go to the doctor and get them fixed, okay? Can God and does God heal? The answer is yes. And to someone he, that he loves, if he did not heal you, he does have something better than healing to give you. It's grace. He'll give you grace to live through it. He'll give you grace to deal with it. He'll, you know, maybe God's trying to humble you. Maybe there's, maybe there's a point of pride in your life that needs to be broken, and God's going to humble you with it. Because that's what it was with Paul. Paul knew, himself, Paul knew himself well. He said, God gave me revelations. Shoot, when I was a, when I was a, 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 a Jew back, was, had zeal of the law, I'd have run that all over town. I'd have been waving my flag all over town and going killing every Christian I, I could find because I, God gave me revelations. And God gave him revelations, and then he gave him a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And God didn't take it from him. God just said, Paul, I'll give you grace. How's that? Paul accepted that. Because what happens, what happens, Mike, what happens if you get like liver cancer and then God heals your liver, okay? And how old are you? 62, okay? So you got a 62-year-old liver that's got cancer and then God heals it. Okay, and I believe in that, okay? you're still going to die, okay? That liver is still going to turn back into dust, regardless, okay? Uh, Paul, they can't hear the volume. Can't hear the microphone. Turn, look at the signals there and make sure everything's turned up about as far as it can go, all right? 
So anyway, that, that lever is still going to give out one way or the other. Okay? Um, we have examples of people in the Bible. The woman with an issue of blood for 12 years, she touched the his garment and her faith made her whole. Now, I believe in that. Did you know she died? She died. What's better than the physical healing of the body? Grace. Grace is always better. Grace will carry you when you cannot carry yourself. Grace will sustain you when you cannot be sustained. When you wake up and the pain is intense, you can always go to God in prayer and say, God, the pain may not go away, but God, you can sustain me and you can give me grace during this thing. And, and by the way, I, I'll t in fact, I, I just remembered something. Right after I had shoulder surgery, um, I was laying in my chair in my office taking a nap one Sunday afternoon, and somehow, some way, this rib right here popped out a joint. And when I got up and, and Sunday evening, I'm hurting bad. I mean, I'm hurting bad. And I finally went to the ER, and the doctor over there thought I was in there for morphine or something like that. She thought I was in there for drugs. And I'm going, I, it hurts to breathe. I can't. I mean, it was killing me. So she wrote me off and sent me off down the road. And I went to see my doctor the next day, and he said, I know what this is. And uh, he said, you got a rib out of joint right here. And he said, normally, he said, I can pop that back in place. But he said, you just had shoulder surgery. He said, I can't touch you. And I went, oh, stinks to be me. So, I mean, that night, he told me, he said, now, if it gets worse, call me. 9.30 that night, I called him. And I said, I can't take this. I said, I am in agony. And he said, Mike, I don't know what to tell you. He said, go to the ER. And I said, they didn't believe me at the ER. He said, well, he said, come back tomorrow if it's still hurting. 12 o'clock that night, 1 o'clock that night, I'm up in the living room, and I'm in agony, pain. I mean, this thing is hurting me bad. And I, and I finally prayed. I said, God, I can't take this anymore. This is killing me. God, I mean, it was hurting bad. I did something, and I, and I took a sharp breath, and I felt that thing hurt, just, you know, sharp, real sharp. As soon as I took that breath, and I went, I bet I can pop that back in place. So I had pain medicine from shoulder surgery. I let her kick in real good. And I leaned over and I went <gasps> like that. Boom! Popped back in place. Sparks shot out of my eye sockets. <laughs> Flames everywhere. But it worked. God healed me. He, he put in my mind to, to know what to do and, and it worked. I believe that. Amen? Amen? And I, I finally went to bed about 3 o'clock that morning. Lisa said, you okay? And I said, I'm okay now. Boy, it hurt. It was sore, but anyway, it was better. But the thing is, God will give you grace. He'll either help you or he'll give you grace. He'll help you or he'll give you grace. And there's nothing, it's not a failure when you ask God to heal you of something and he doesn't. What he's got is something better for you. Can get amen out of God's people. Amen. God's not evil. He's not mean. He's not restricted to our mentality or our thinking. He is all sovereign, all knowing, all powerful God. It is not waiting on you to do before he can do. There are devils who cannot do until you let them, but God is not that way. Can I get amen out of God's people? Amen. So that's, that's kind of the basis where I'm going. But let's go back to 1 Corinthians now, 1 Corinthians 12. And he said, he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. In verse 8, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit. The key of this passage is word. Word. Word of wisdom. Word of knowledge. It's your Bible. Here's your wisdom right here. Here's your knowledge right here. This is what you need. This is, in fact, you can trust this. You ever had one of those thoughts that you thought might have been from God, but you weren't sure? You ever had one of those? You know how you can test it? If you find it in the Bible, it came from God. If you don't find it in here, it wasn't from God. See how simple that is? Your Bible is the key to everything. You say, well, Pastor, what about, it says in verse 9, to another faith by the same spirit. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It is the word of faith. Paul said in Romans 10, the word of faith which we preach. So it's the Bible. That's where your faith comes from. God gave you a gift by way of the Spirit of God through your Bible. What about the gift of healing? 
because I because when when Benny is up on stage and he's walking around he's not giving them Bible verses he's not doing that he's he takes his coat off at sometimes and waves it at him you ever seen him do that he'll take it he'll, he's a big theatrical guy and, and in this is really, it's all about the theatrics. Take his coat off and wave it in front of people, and they all fall down like dominoes, and he's healed them with his coat wind. Todd Bentley, who's one of these, I mean, he is, he's something else. He does antics up on stage like you would not believe, and in one case, he kicked some woman in the chest to kick the devil out of her, to heal her. Sick. Something wrong with that. But you know what? This Hollywood generation we live in, that's what we like. We like, we like the showmanship of what these guys are doing. But what about the gift of healing? Are you saying, Pastor Mike, that God will heal us through the Bible? Well, let's see what God said. Turn to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. Look in verse, and you might want to underline these verses in your Bible, make a little note by them. Psalm 107, verse 19. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them. Under, you might want to underline that word, saveth. I like the word saved in the Bible. He saveth them out of their distresses. Verse 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. What did it say he did? He sent his word and healed them. How did he heal them? With his word. What, who was Jesus walking around? The word. the word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who was that walking around healing everybody? It was the word of God. It was the word of God healing everybody. That's what heals us. Uh, let me just read some more verses here for you. You won't have to turn to all of them. You might want to jot them down. Look at them later if you want to. Psalm 6, verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak, and heal me, for my bones are vexed. Now, this was written. He said, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, for I am weak. Heal me. For my bones are vexed. The healing here is, is connected with something that David had done that, that had caused God to be angry with him. So he said, number one, have mercy upon me, for I'm weak, which you are. You are weak. Um, it's like, I don't know, my, my wife just, every now and she craves certain things. And she'll say, nope, I'm not eating them. And all I got to do is go buy it, and there it is. She's got them. Oreo cookies and stuff. I mean, that's the kind of stuff she likes. I'm the same way. You just wave it in front of me, and it's over with, all right? Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I'm weak. Heal me, for my bones are vexed. It's the healing of God in his bones. Psalm 30, verse 1. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. The healing here is a reference to the, the healing of the soul. Thou hast, not, thou hast brought my soul from the grave you have physical maladies in your flesh you also have infirmities in your soul which would you rather have if you had to make a choice which you would, would you rather have would you rather have the physical healing and go to hell or would you rather walk through life main and be in heaven and have your soul healed the word will heal your soul Psalm 41 verse 2 the Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. He shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him into the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing, that will make all his bed in his sickness. Um, I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Heal my soul. Psalm, uh, Psalm 41, verse 2 through 4. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. What is the healing that you need? Soul healing. You need it. 
You need it bad because you sinned against God and you need God to heal you. Psalm 103, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Now watch this now, verse 3, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. He said he forgiveth thine iniquities and healeth thy diseases. This is in your soul that he's referring to. You sinned against God. You have iniquity in your soul. That needs to be healed. That, that needs to be made sound now. And uh, so, you, so it doesn't kill you. Uh, verse 4, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. All of this has to do with sin. Now, I, I, had, a, I had a guy tell me one time, and I was out in Bible college one day, and he was telling me that if you're sick, it's because you sinned. He said, like right now, I got a cold. And he said, I know that I should be able to deliver me, myself from this cold by my faith. He said, but for some reason I can't do it. He said, it's because I've sinned. Well, did you ask God to forgive you? Yeah. Well, then it should be done then. But they had attributed every, everything that you do is because of sin. And here, here's the thing. This is laying an extra layer of burden upon you. Raise your hand if, since you met Christ at the cross, raise your hand if you totally became sin-free and hadn't, hadn't done anything wrong since 1981. When did you get saved, Jim? Last year? Two years ago? Two years. R remind him of his name later, okay? You know what I know about him? He sinned since two years ago. Okay? What does that mean? It means we're done. The bell rang. Have to have to leave here. But it's the tender mercies of God. And what they're trying they're trying to lay an, an added layer upon you of burden by telling you. And in fact they'll look at you and judge you. If you say, well, boy, I tell you what, I'm just I'm sniffling real bad. I got a real bad cold. That crowd will look at you and say, you've done something wrong against God. They will immediately judge you and say, you've sinned. You've got something. Maybe it's, maybe God, maybe you were going to put $300 in the plate last month and only put two. Because that's what they're getting at. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe if you'll just give more, God will heal you. See, it's a, carnivals do the same thing. They just don't bring God into it, okay? They do the same thing. Did you hear about this? The idiot went to the carnival. They had a game at the carnival. He started playing that game. He kept coming close. He took out his life savings, some $2,100, and wasted it at that game to win that Xbox. He could have bought three of them at Walmart for that. A fool and his money are soon departed, the Bible says. But it's the idea, just like at a carnival, they'll tell you, oh, you're all so close, but you're not close enough. Oh, you almost got it that time, but it didn't work. That's what they're telling you. They'll lay that burden and that bondage on top of you. When Christ came to set us free... Who in here had a good dad? Raise your hand. Who, who had a really good dad? Okay. You had a good dad? You got a good dad? Daddy, can I have some money? You ever done that? Did he, get, did he give you some gravel out of the driveway? Was he good to you? Did he love you? You know what the Bible says about your dad? He's evil. That's what it says about me, too. I'm a dad. I'm evil. Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more your father in heaven? And see, the thing is, we always told our kids, if you do that, I'm going to take away all your Christmas. You ever, you ever told them that? Did we ever do it? We gave it to them. Not because they deserved it, not because they earned it. A lot of times we give it to them because we love them. And we care about them. And our Father in heaven, who is not evil, gives unto us good things for the same reason, because he loves us.
He cares about us. So I, I believe in healing. I believe that the biggest healing that you need is in your soul. And I believe God's got a remedy for that. And he's not going to make you jump through flaming hoops in order to get it. If you'll ask, he'll give. Okay? Or he'll give you something better. I promise you. I promise you he will.